Magnified King, Chapter 18, The Tabernacle. The tent was like the house of a very rich man. Rich rugs covered the ground. Rich curtains overhung alcoves the size of rooms, and soft voices hummed behind them. One was evidently a kitchen, and Taharka's mouth watered at the savory odors hanging in the air. At the end of what looked like a great hall was a low chair, and in it, a man. He was simply dressed, like a soldier at rest, but the jewels on his fingers and arms could have ransomed a city. He was slender, not very tall, not very old. His heavy black beard was held in place by a jeweled net. His face, half turned away and outlined by the light from the clay lamps, was narrow, sharp-nosed, handsome. Taharka could not see his eyes. The soldier laid his hand on Taharka's so shoulder to move him forward. Taharka shook it off and walked slowly toward the man in the chair. There was no doubt in his mind who it was. The Rob Shaka hovered over the chair. He spoke to Taharka as if to a slave. On your knees before the king. Taharka hesitated an instant too long. The soldier thrust him to the ground with the butt end of his spear and held him there. Taharka gritted his teeth against the pain. Enough. The voice was flat, toneless, indifferent, but was instantly obeyed. The soldier took away the spear. Taharka straightened his back and raised his head. Now he could see the man's eyes. They could have been the eyes of Shabataka. They say you are a doctor. A physician's assistant, Taharka was pleased with himself. His voice was steady. He had made up his mind. He would say nothing but what was asked of him. Nothing added, nothing explained. There could be plenty of work for you here. The pay is good. The army of Sennacherib has no physicians? Already he had broken his rule. Sennacherib the king smiled, just a little. He leaned forward in his chair, his eyes narrowed, searching the eyes of Taharka. Who are you? My name is Haru. Yes, Haru. Hawk, not a common name among common men. What are you? I'm a physician's assistant. A physician's assistant, a boy, a Cushite boy who speaks the tongue of Babylon and Nineveh in the accents of the courts, who has crossed the desert route with Bedouin rebels on his way. Where and why? Taharka said nothing. He did not lower his eyes. After a while, the king leaned back in his chair. Our scribes need information for their records. News from Egypt is confused and hard to gather. The Cushite kings still wear the double crown. They do. Taharka did not try to conceal his pride. If they did not, he thought, there would be no double crown. Who wears the crown? Our recorders still write of the old king, Shaba, Shabaka, but now we hear of a Shebitiku, Shabtaku, and rumors of a pretender who pops up here and there, Tarku, Tirhaka. Taharka is the true king. Taharka himself was startled by the ring of anger in his voice. Careful, Haru, he told himself. You are Hawk, the physician's assistant. What difference to you who wears the double crown? The king was smiling again, his wise little smile. That's as may be. He stretched himself like a cat, turning his head toward the Rob Shaka. What was the other thing? Oh, yes, the beast, the Rob Shaka whispered in his ear. 
Worth the price of a good horse? Yes, a fine gift for my boy in Nineveh, my little Ir, um, Isar Haddon. The king's face had suddenly softened, and, for some reason, Taharka felt a strange thrill along his spine like a warning of the future. He did not understand why. But the king had finished. No more tonight. There's a hard day ahead of us tomorrow. You will find it interesting, young hawk. And think, as you watch it, of Egypt and Cush. He nodded to the Rabshaka, who nodded to Taharka's guard. Taharka was jerked to his feet. He looked back once as he was led from the chair. The king and the Rabshaka were talking softly. The Rabshaka was watching him. Sabi rose from the campfire as they approached, wiping away the traces of tears. I thought we would never see you again. What happened? Amos's face was tense. Taharka glanced at Sabi and shook his head. They just wanted some information for their records. Their records, said Amos with contempt. They don't need information. They write whatever will please the king, and the stonecutters engrave it on their pillars. Sabi clung to, suddenly to Taharka. I am afraid, Haru, he whispered again. I'm afraid of tomorrow. Chapter 19 don't let them see you cry. Up, up, you mukri rebels, on your feet. See what becomes of traitors. Watch and see. The sun was red in the east. Still heavy with sleep, the Bedouins were herded together to witness the death of Lachish. The little fortress city stood tight and proud on its high ground across the plain, surrounded by its deep wall of heavy brick and stone. On the wall, and on the turrets, the defenders of the town had massed themselves with bows and slings and fire sticks. Taharka's heart beat fast with sympathy and an unreasonable hope. Could they do it? Could they hold out? They were brave enough. Their walls were strong. The king comes forth! On a rise of high ground above the tabernacle, a throne had been raised, a high armed chair of cedar wood carved with figures of slaves and captains, sorry, captives, draped with rich cloth of purple from the city of Tyre. To the sound of trumpets, the massive folds of the great tent were drawn back, and Sennacherib the king came out into the light. Today, uh, he was appareled as a king indeed, a fringed purple robe embroidered and shot with silver, bracelets of heavy gold on his arms, purple boots on his feet, the high crown of Assyria on his head. His hair and beard were clubbed and netted and shone with gold and jewels. Rejecting the aid of his guards, he gathered up the skirt of his robe and hopped onto the throne as jauntily as a boy vaulting a donkey. Once again, Taharka was reminded of Shabataka with his poise and self-confidence. The air echoed with the shouts of the soldiers. A spearman placed in his left hand the long, lithe Assyrian bow, and in his right the iron-headed arrow. The shouts had died away. The silence was broken only by the birds who, at least, seemed to be going about business as usual. Slowly, almost casually, Sennacherib fitted the arrow to the bow, sighting along the shaft like a man testing his weapon. He let the arrow fly. It found no mark, the king being positioned well beyond the range of the bowmen on the walls. But as it pierced the ground below the city, a roar that shook the earth arose from the army of the Assyrians. There was no more silence. The air shivered with the sound of bulls' horns and trumpets of brass, and then the drums, and then... Thrust forward from behind the straining, quivering men of the infantry with their groaning cries of heave, 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 the siege engines rolled out. Up the earthen ramps they crawled like giant beetles or warrior ants. 
Nothing could stop them. Arrows and rocks from the slings rained down from the walls. The giant guard shields turned them aside like toys. The fire, hissed Taharka, teeth clenched, shivering, as if there was a question as to how it would all end. Where is their fire? The defenders had fire. Torches blazing with burning oil, fire bombs hurtling down upon the siege cars. The air began to fill with the sickening smell of smoke they remembered from Ascalon. A scream arose from one of the men guiding the rams, but every tower had its supply of water. And behind every guard shield stood a man whose only task was to douse the flames. The siege engines rolled on. Sennacherib nodded to the tartan who nodded to the high captain of the infantry. The drums thundered. The foot soldiers began to march and, flanking them, the bowmen artillery ran on ahead, crouching behind the shield barriers, dropping to their knees to take aim. The first of the Lachish defenders to die fell from the walls, slowly, it seemed, turning and tumbling in the air. Soon, the air was full of those twisting, turning bodies, full of cries and shrieks of agony. Gods, whispered Taharka, gods. Why don't they come out? Why don't they meet them on the ground? Watch and see, said Amos bitterly. The gate had been opened. The men of Lachish poured out in their peaked helmets, swords and spears at the ready. Taharka could not hear, but he could see Sennacherib's laughter. With an almost good-humored gesture, he waved toward a rise of ground not far away, and then down they poured at his command. Not chariots, but men on horseback. For the first time, Taharka saw what they could do. Once in his childhood days, he had seen a pride of lions closing in on a gazelle. The picture burned in his mind as he watched the horsemen of Sennacherib closing in on the line of men issuing from the gate of Lachish. A few of them broke away. The horses swerved as easily, it seemed, as men on foot. But so high and terrible above the helpless foot soldiers, hooves trampling, their riders with uh, swords already red with blood hacking down from those unassailable heights. One man managed to dodge free running out across the field toward where the Mukri caravan stood to watch and see. The horsemen held back a little, playing with him like cats with a mouse. Taharka thought he might make it and strained forward, his hands stretched out to draw him into the shelter of the little band. The Mukri were ready to fight for him with sticks and stones if need be. But the horsemen tired of the game, closed upon him and cut and trampled him down. And now the siege cars had reached the walls, the great jagged rams in place. Heave, 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 crack, crumble, crash. Bricks and earth poured inward. The giant stones groaned and tottered and fell. Great gaping holes appeared in the walls. Taharka closed his eyes. The town of Lachish was open to its enemies. And here I have to take a break because Timothy brought me a homemade donut. So, just a second. Oh my gosh. That's really good. <laughs> I wish you were all at my house. I would share donuts. He made these little yummy donut holes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, we will resume. Better drink some water. Okay. The Assyrian infantry was running now, line upon line of men, spears leveled, thirsty for blood. The soldiers of Lachish were no longer soldiers. Like small, terrified animals pursued by predators, they scurried here and there about the field. And the predators had no mercy. There were to be no war prisoners. Not one was to be left alive. Grim and businesslike, like market butchers, 
The Asterian slashed and thrust. The chariots rolled across the plain, crushing all that stood or lay in their path. And the whole great army, as if according to some inexorable plan, now drew together, bearing down upon the gaping wall of Lachish. The sun was high. It had not taken long. Their captive caravan was prodded forward, spears to their backs. Up, up, you mukri, up to the wall. Watch and see. The horror had begun. The Assyrians poured through the breaches in the wall. Inside the city, the fires had begun to burn, and a great mushroom-like cloud of black smoke rose and hung above the turrets and rooftops. The drums and trumpets were still, and the cries of the people, one endlessly keening wail, hung in the air like smoke. Then Taharka saw them. Beneath the wall, through the breaches and the gateway, the sign of the Assyrians, the lifeless bodies thrust through and hanging high upon the long, sharpened stakes. Stand tall, top Sabi, said Taharka, for the little boy had quailed and tried to hide his face. Don't let them see you cry. And, though trembling, the little boy stood stony still and watched the scene of terror. After a while, the lines appeared on the ramps and the roadway. Lines of women, children, young boys, a few old men roped together and tottering beneath the loads of wealth of lackish heaped upon their backs. Where are they going? whispered Sabi. Where will they take them? They will carry the robber's loot as far as Nineveh, said Amos. Those few who survive. After that, who knows? May God pity them, these people of Judah. On a gold-washed litter, raised high like a god, Sennacherib the king had been brought up, too, to watch and see. Slowly, Taharka turned to look upon him. What would he see in his face? Pity? Regret for necessary severity? Hatred for the rebels? Cruel pleasure at their suffering? He saw none of these. Sennacherib looked bored. He had done a good day's work and wanted it over quickly so he could get back to the good dinner that awaited him in his tabernacle. Perhaps dictate a letter to his favorite son, his little boy in Nineveh. Gods, thought Taharka, how I hate him. It was a deep and abiding hatred. And for a while, he could not distinguish his hatred from Sennacherib from his hatred for his brother, Shabataka. The dead, most of the population of the little fortress town, had been hastily piled into a mass grave, a rock tomb south of the city. The smoke was drifting away. The tartan, flanked by his guards, tired and grim, walked restlessly up and down before the Bedouin caravan. So, Mukri, he said, you have seen. You have learned a good lesson. You will teach it well. There was no reply. The Bedouins watched him, fascinated, exhausted, stunned by the terror of the day. You are free to go, said the tartan. Dazed and stumbling, they struggled to their feet. All but one, said the tartan. Taharka closed his eyes and dropped his sack. He had known it all along. The Cushite boy, said the tartan. The physician, the great king has use for him in Jerusalem. For a long moment, he looked at Taharka, a measuring, searching look. Then he turned away. The rest of you, he said, move out. Sabi clung to Taharka. I won't leave you, he said. I can't leave you here to be killed. They won't kill me, said Taharka. I think they have another purpose in mind. And listen, Sabi, I have a job for you. He dropped to his knees, his hands on the little boy's shoulders. You were right. They do want Hermes. 
The king wants him for his son in Nineveh. Hermes is a Nile donkey, a royal donkey. He must not serve the Assyrians. You must take him quickly, hide him among the pack animals, and move out now. And as it happened, the sun was not much lower when an Assyrian soldier appeared with orders to move the Cushite donkey to the king's temporary stables beneath the wall of the city. But Hermes was gone. Taharka saw Amos once more before the Mukrigan caravan moved out. Amos made no offer to remain with him, but looked at him a long time, as if trying to convey a message. I will see you again, he said softly, soon at Jerusalem. <laughs>